to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire, and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love. In other words, when we learned last week that was charity, charity to um, other people. Um, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at the first. Now, again, I want to reiterate, this is a church that's got a lot of, doing a lot of good stuff, isn't it? Mm -hmm. They're doing more now than they are at the first. And I think I shared last week that you'll see a lot of churches, they'll do that, they'll start out, and they're always adding programs to their church services. They're always adding more and more stuff, trying to figure out how to get more and more stuff into their church to try to draw people. And he's saying, you're doing more now than you were doing at the first. But then he says, he says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering with her um, and, I, and I will make those who commit adultery with her to suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will re repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not, do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets... I will impose on you no other burden. And so I just want to read about, you know, we talked about the secrets last week about it puts people to sleep. Um, yeah, it could be physical sleep. I know sometimes we have a hard time staying awake in this church. But why is that? Because <laughs> we, Saturday nights aren't the best nights for us because we, um, when, when you're coming into the presence of God, you know, your flesh is always just a little bit, What's the word I want to use? Somebody come up with a word. Huh? Apprehensive, um, you know, expecting, and yet just a tad bit fearful. You know, because when God shows up, we have God in our services. You know, His presence is in our service, and you never know what He's going to do. And many of you pray. You know, it's not like I do everything or me and Kathy do everything. You know, everybody here has a part to play. And so you never know what God's going to have you do. You might go into travail, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't, you don't never know if you're going to do that. And so you're thinking of all the things. Usually when I go to sleep, I'm thinking, you know, what are you going to do tomorrow, God? What's going to happen, you know? And so many people here, they get their music. You don't know what's going to happen during that. He may have you pray something. He may have you do He may have you walk around the room with a limp. You don't know what he's going to have you do. So we have a hard time. We, Kathy and I, we have a hard time sleeping on Saturday nights. And some of you have shared the same thing. Some of you get up real early. Some people come down here and they start to heat up and they start the air conditioning up and they start the water up in the, in the, you know, the plumbing that we have that we shut off and on. And they come down here early. They get up early. Some people, does anybody here pray before service? But quite a bit. Yeah, see, and so by the time we get here, <laughs> we've almost had a full day. So I'm not talking necessarily about that sleep, although you, we sleep because we're so tired, not because we're bored. This can cause you to sleep because you're bored of the service, you're bored of the sermon. Or it causes you, this is the deeper meaning, it, it, Satan's so-called deep secret causes you to be asleep spiritually. You have no idea what's going on in the, in the earth realm or in the spirit realm or the earth realm. And that you try to gain it politically. You look at what's going on, the wars and everything in Israel, and that's how you think you know what's going on. But I've been hearing that for 40 years, and they've been wrong for 40 years. Why? Because they've been asleep. Because that's what this spirit does is it puts you to sleep. And then we read earlier it says it causes you to eat food sacrificed to idols. And we learned last week or I shared last week that you know, what they would do in the, all in the Old Testament is they would offer food to their idol. But the idol couldn't eat it, so they would eat it. But you would gain the nature and character of that idol. 
You know, it's no different than us. If we give the first of our food to the Holy Spirit, to God, to Jesus, what do we get in return? We get His nature and character. So if I offer my first, we learned last week, this is, let's say to sports, what's the nature and character of sports? Competition. 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 What else? Glory. Pride. Glory. What? Glory. Glory. Pride. Glory. Physical injury. Winning. Anger. Anger. Rivalry. Rivalry. Fear. Fear. Money, anxiety. Yeah, that's what I mean. Physical. There's actually people that try to hurt other people. In other words, if you give your first to that, you'll start picking up the nature and character of that. Is there anything wrong with sports? No, as long as you give your first to God. That's good. That's good. You got to give the first. The food that they offered to the the idols, they would give. you know this to be true. They would always find, like a lot of times, some of the primitive tribes, they would find a young virgin to offer to the gods. Why, didn't, why wouldn't they pick an old person? Huh? They're not fresh. They would offer the best to their gods. And, that, and that's what God says to us. Give the first of your flocks, the first of your sacrifices, the first of your offerings to me. And what this spirit does, it causes you to give your first to the culture. And you give what's left over to God. So whatever you give to the culture, you're going to pick up the nature and character of that piece of culture. Something I want to say something to us here now is that, let's see, do I want to share this now or do I want to share this later? If I try it later, I'll probably forget. <clears throat> the charismatic church has been very, very good at getting people out of the evil side of the culture. The idolatry of the evil side of the culture. In other words, we can look at the testimony of some of the people here and some of the things that you were involved in What nature and character did you get of the things that you were involved in? (laughs) I see everybody smiling and going, yeah, yeah, because you're thinking, you know what I'm talking about. But one of the bad things about the charismatic church is uh, most of the charismatic church, and for years, has had this spirit in it. Because what did we do? We turned you from the evil side of the culture to the good side of the culture. We got you off of drugs, but then got you onto money. You see what I mean? I mean, all the messages were based on the good side of the American culture. And God was to be used to gain the good side of the American culture. And so people get up and they give testimonies. You know, I was a drug agonist, and everybody goes, yay! Yay! What are you hooked on now, though? What's driving your life now, though? No, I mean driving your life. I know what you say in church. We all say the right thing in church. We all draw near Him with our mouth and honor Him with our lips in church. But what is driving your actions, your reactions, your emotions, your decision making? What is, is it now the good side of the American culture? So we're real good, the charismatic, you know, the denominations fail to getting them out of the evil side. They can't even get them out of the evil side for the most part. I shouldn't say all denominations. But a lot of denominational churches, I know the churches here in town, when, when you go into church, if you've got something wrong with you, it's probably going to stay with you the rest of your life. If you've got some kind of idolatry in your life, you're probably not going to get free of it. There's a lot of men in this town that, are, that go to church, sit in a church service, and sitting in there probably right now that are hooked on pornography. Yeah, I didn't commit adultery on my wife, but I'm hooked on pornography. That's what I mean. You're still, you're still getting... It doesn't make any difference whether you're on the good side of the culture or the evil side. You're still getting the nature and character of that idol. How many people get in music ministry? 
they come out of the rock band, you know, the drug, the drug sex rock band, and they, they turn into gospel singers. What's still driving them, though? What's still driving them? Money, power, notoriety, girls. fame, girls. So they got off the evil side and got onto the good side. And they still, and they still got the nature and character. You know what I mean? You, we just hooked them on something else. We turned them from one idol. We think if we turn them from one idol to another, we, we've made them Christians. Twice dead. That's right. Twice dead. Pulled up by the roots. And so you and I have to be careful because most of us, well, we all, all of us, came out of the evil side, didn't we? You've got testimonies of where you came from. Be very, very careful that you don't fall victim to the good side. Because it can happen without you knowing it. All of a sudden, you're caught up in American culture. Because if you get off the evil side and God starts moving in you and you start to become a faithful, you know, a, a diligent type of person, the enemy's going to take that faithfulness and diligence and he's going to turn it towards something of the good side of the American culture. And before you know it, you're hooked into the American, and you don't even know what's happened. You still think you're serving God, but that thing out there is still driving your emotions, your decision-making, your actions, your reactions. That is now where you are now giving your first. And that's what this spirit causes. You're putting all your actions now and reactions are, caught, are being out there, and that's why when we walk into churches, they're dead. There's not much emotion going on. There's not much passion going on. There's not much strength going forth in church. It's all saved for the sexual immorality out here in the culture. Is there anything wrong with being diligent in business or in your job or in your marriage? Of course not. But God is supposed to get the first. God is supposed to get the first. So with these scriptures in mind, I want you to turn with me because this is, this is, how, I can, this is how I know. Uh, just, just, just turn back. Well, you don't have to. I always say that. Just have it. I'm going to go to John, 1 John, his epistle. Uh, I'm going to go to chapter 2, I think. Again, all, we know all these scriptures, you know. There's just about, I guess there's some books that we don't uh, read a lot of scriptures out of that we wouldn't be familiar with, but um, we're pretty familiar with the ones I'm probably mostly going to be given here this morning. This is 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Why do you think that is? There you go. Thank you. Yeah, you can't serve two masters. If you love the world, then the love of God is not in you. Now, how sad is that, that you're sitting in church thinking you're Christian while all your love and all the first goes to the world? It says the love of the Father isn't in you. Now, think of how many people are sitting in church that that applies to. Can we look at ourselves? Does that apply to us? Be forewarned. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life <clears throat> is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, <clears throat> and the lust of it. Listen to this. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So we read that scripture, and this scripture tells on what spirit either you have 
or your leadership in your church has, because I've been pressing this a lot here lately, is the increase in God. If your people are passing away, I don't mean dying. If they are losing interest as they get older, if they're losing their passion for God, if they're losing their hope in God, if they're losing their call in God, they love the world. And that spirit is because the spirit of Jezebel loves the the culture. So anytime we're passing away, if you're losing your interest, if you're losing, check up on yourself. Because the world, it says, is passing away. You and I, if we're increasing in something, guess what? Something else has to be decreasing. If you're increasing in God, something else has to decrease. So if the world is increasing in you, you'll start passing away. You know the Bible tells on us. You know the Bible, if you if you knew what the all if we knew the Bible by heart, it would let us know exactly where we're at. You know, Kathy and I have been married 51 years. And in today's culture, in the culture, the American culture, if you have a marriage that's that long and you are comfortable with each other, that's probably the top of the line for marriage in the culture. And there are varying degrees of that. If you go down from being very comfortable with each other, then you get down to tolerating each other. And then you get down to disliking each other, but it's too much trouble to get a divorce, and then it, it goes down to divorce. But you know what? That's not God's way to be comfortable with one another. Our marriage is supposed to increase. You know what? We'd learned here several weeks ago about how Christ treats the church and we made the comparison with marriage. She's supposed to get my first. The first of my conversation, the first of my love, the first of a soul connection, the first of my spirit, the first of my body. She's supposed to get it and vice versa. I'm not saying we ain't got it down perfect, but we're almost there. (laughs) But I wouldn't be satisfied with just being comfortable. We've talked in this church about the comfort stuff and and the comfort that that has infiltrated the church to where... Again, that's culture. Jezebel will cause you to focus on culture. And so comfortable is, isn't, that's not what we wanted. We want an increase. <clears throat> um, let me read a couple, I want to read a couple of scriptures about increase. I'm going to go to Ephesians. Because just to show you, of course, we always, I always quote the scripture here, in here, that of the increase of his government, there shall be no end. Right? So that's one scripture. I'll just quote it. But this is in Ephesians, it's chapter 4. Eleven. Verse 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. What for? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And what does edify mean? Huh? Build up. But how do we build up? How does God build up? Yeah, thank you. He takes stuff out, and that enlarges for more of him to move in. You understand what I mean? I mean, if you take all the furniture out of your house, all of a sudden I've heard people say this, boy, this room really looks big. Why? Because you took all the stuff out of it. 
Now you can move something else back in. So whenever God talks about edifying, don't, He's not going to build you up and leave all the same stuff in you. He's going to remove stuff out of you and then move some stuff back in, and that will build you up. Because the stuff He moves in is a lot better than the stuff He takes out. So people always got this idea that God is, we're supposed to come to church and I'm supposed to make you feel better. And that's what I do. Huh? Sure. It's no different than getting rid of your old stuff. How many like to get... You have things that are old that you hang on to for countless years. Sentimental value, or it reminds you of something. Get rid of it, you'll need it. I'll fit into it next year. This is my dream dress. This is, I have a dream dress. <laughs> and God comes along and wants to take that. And how do you feel about that? Yeah, you don't want to let go of it. Like you say, I may need that. I mean, I may need that intimidating spirit one of these days. That's true. That's protected it exactly. I, that's what I'm saying. I may need that dominating spirit. Don't take that away. I might need that. It might come in handy someday. That anger might come in handy someday. Yeah, it'll come back in style. <laughs> that's a good one. And so when I preach to you, yeah, you're, there's a part of you that's saying, I don't want to let go of that. I'm going to hang on to that and la-da-da-da-da. But then if you let go of it, you'll feel good. So I have made you feel good. Like it or not, yeah, I've made, we've made you angry. Kathy's made you angry. I've made you angry. But in the end, it turns out for the best. And just like when you give up that old crap that you've been hanging on to, when you finally give it up and, and, and the, the idolatry of it leaves... You're going to think, I wonder why I kept that so long. Why did I hang on to that so long? <clears throat> it, you like to hang on to it because it reminds you, it, it, it actually, look, it actually becomes a part of you. Yeah, you don't even recognize it. It actually becomes a part of you. I mean... <laughs> I've, I've gotten, I've sold them. But I used to have guns I didn't want to get rid of. I knew I'd never use them again. But they were a part of me. They were part of my young life. And I didn't want to sell them. But I knew I'd never use them again. And, I th and so it finally came to the brain, why hang on to something you're never going to use again? Well, that's the way God is. If you really let God have that anger, you, ne you don't really need to use it again. We hang on to it because we think we've got, so got, it's part of us, it's some, a sentimental thing to us, and we've had it all our life, we don't want to give it up. But if we really let God into our lives, you'd give those things up and say, because that's not his nature, whether it's dominating or intimidating or witchcraft or whatever it is, huh? manipulating, whatever it is, you would give it up because you, you would know, I can't use that anymore. It's done. I'm not, I don't need it. I'm not going to use that anymore. So it's really hard to edify a body of Christ because everybody's got stuff that we grew up with that Jezebel wants to touch and get you to stay in so that you can continue to have that nature and character of that beast. For the edifying of the body of Christ, what? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, 
to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. How can anybody know this scripture and not say we're not to be transformed into his image? How can anybody read this and say we can't walk without sin, that we can't be made like him? I don't get that. But they, they do. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes what? Mine says growth, but the King James says causes increase of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, Colossians. Yeah, the whole healthy is the whole body is healthy and growing, and full, <clears throat> and full of love. And you know, Terry said, you know, she just gave a exhortation <clears throat> this morning and was talking about me and Kathy. You know what? You probably don't want another me in here. One's probably enough. I need somebody like her. I need some. I need a feeler in here. I need somebody like that because I don't, I feel some things, but I don't feel. I don't sense near what she feels. I need her prayer. I need her music. I need her prayer. I need your teaching. I need, I need everybody in here has got something. And that's what we're working for is a body that grows up in love that is all working for the edifying of itself. Colossians. I just wanted you to see the increase there. I think it's uh, I think it's two. Um, well, yeah, just a minute. Colossians, oh, I'm in Philippians. What? <laughs> that won't work. Colossians chapter 2. I think I'm going to start in, uh, I think I'm going to go ahead and start in verse 16. Now, again, I've read all these. I've got them underlined, so we've read these before. It says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat, or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come, but the reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, mine says, grows as God causes it to grow. But I think, what does anybody have a King James Version? It then says it increases with the increase that is from God. That's what my new King, uh, that's what. Grows as God nourishes. Yeah, in other words, everything is supposed to increase in God. That, that point I'm trying to make, and we all know this, is that everything is supposed to increase. Our praise and worship, our passion, everything here should increase. Yes, your body may not be able to do what it used to do, but the passion is still there in your heart. You know what I mean? And if it's passing away, then you've got Jezebel in your church. If you get older and you start to lose interest, that world is passing away. And you've got to understand something is that preachers need to start preaching the nature and character of God because that's where this is at. I shared with you last week that, that Jezebel hides behind the word legalism. I didn't go into much detail with that, so I will this morning. Is that if, it, if she can't get you into legalism, she'll get you to hide behind legalism. You know what legalism is? I don't like to use that word because it's not a Bible word. But there is such a thing as legalism. In other words, preaching this word of God without the Holy Spirit would be legalism. 
And since we've not preached the nature and character of God, that's basically what we've preached is legalism. Without the Spirit of God causing you to want to keep this word, showing you the value of who He is, then what's it going to cause in you for you to try to keep it without Him? You're going to die. You know the, the scripture I shared with you out of Lamentations about the prophets? I'll read it. If I can get there. I know I'm in Jeremiah. I'm just trying to get past it. Huh? Yeah, I know, I'm in 51 now. Boy, 51's a long chapter. Lamentations. I've read this scripture before. It says, the visions of your prophets, oh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 2, or, or chapter 2, verse 14. The visions of your prophets, actually, I didn't, I didn't know you all turned there. I was just going to read it. The visions of your prophets were false and worthless. They did not expose your sin to ward off your captivity. The prophecies they gave you were false and misleading. I love that scripture because, you know, the prophets were not to expose your sin to make you feel bad, to make the prophet feel better than you were, to condemn you, or to make you feel guilty. It was to ward off your captivity. So I would like to ask this church, just to show you how this thing is supposed to work, how much captivity has been warded off of you since you started coming here? We're not the same people. We're completely changed people. You guys are completely changed people from when you walked in. Even the countenance has changed. The physical appearance has changed. But you know what? We're still captive to some things. And that prophet is supposed to ward off your captivity. And I've said this before. Imagine sitting before God or standing before God after you've been in ministry your whole life and you didn't ward off anybody's captivity and they just got into worse and worse captivity under your ministry. You preached nothing as to why Jesus came. You know, I was preaching here, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago and I was talking about the guy who was telling we need to grovel about our sin like Judas did. You remember when I shared that? That he was sharing that? And I said they probably got it from the man who cried out for mercy. You know, the, the tax collector who said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. We lift that scripture out and we make that a whole doctrine in our church. That all we're supposed to do is grovel and ask God for mercy all the time. Why are we supposed to do that? If you read the rest of your Bible, let's take the whole Bible. Why are you supposed to do that? Because if you're really praying from your heart, be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you know what God's going to do? He's going to be merciful to you. But what does that mean? That means He's going to send you people that expose your sin to ward off your captivity. He's going to send you people with revelation. He's going to send you people that will preach the nature and character of God, who God really is. He will send you people that will preach things that eye hasn't seen and ear hasn't heard. That's what He's going to send you. You don't spend your whole life groveling, saying, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's a reason. I'm not taken away from that, but there's a reason you pray that. Yeah, you open up your heart to Him. That opens, that opens the door for Him to come and speak. And that's what He did throughout the entire Old Testament. And every time the prophets came to, to set them free, they killed Him. They'd get in trouble, they'd get in bondage to some nation or some country, some group of people. They'd cry out to God, God would deliver them. And he, what's a, one of the most famous scriptures that you, you've heard quoted many times, if my people that are called by my name, what, will humble themselves, pray, and turn from their evil ways, I will what? I will hear from You hear that preached all the time. And I will heal your land. 
So we get up, we get on this big bandwagon, you know, we're gonna humble ourselves and we're gonna pray and we're gonna turn from our evil ways and da 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 da. And then God starts sending somebody to teach you how to turn from your evil ways and you kill them. You crucify them, you stone them, you put them to death with the sword. He's trying to be merciful to us. Because there are people who pray this prayer, but it doesn't do any good to pray this prayer if you're gonna reject what God sends you. You double-minded goofball. Be merciful to me. Be merciful to me, a sinner. And God sends you somebody. I don't want that. And Jezebel will kill any prophet, any minister that is trying to bring you into that mercy. You know, I, we've shared in here that we have victory over death. Do you know if man came up with a way to have victory over death? What do you think, if a, if a guy figured that out, what do you think would happen to him? Be He'd be what? Highly, Highly exalted. exalted, wouldn't he? Richer than, richer than Solomon. Than Solomon. <laughs> He'd be on every magazine cover. He'd be on every TV interview, wouldn't he? He'd be, on, he'd be the most famous person in the world. People would just love him. People would have maybe even have their picture in their living room of him. If he wrote a book, everybody would buy it. And Jesus has provided that, and you preach that, and they will kill you for it. As, 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 because as long as man comes up with it, it's okay. As long as man heals, it's okay. As long as man comes up with something, it's okay. But if God comes up with something, we have to let him rule over us. Yeah. Now it's not okay. We'll not allow this man to rule over us. You know, Jesus, it says, Jesus came in the fullness of time. You know, there was people praying for the Messiah. Did you know that? Yes. So God sends them the Messiah, and what do they do? Kill him. They kill him. Happens, there's nothing new under the sun, it's still happening today. And that spirit will kill it, try to kill it every time because this, that spirit wants the culture to rule over you, not God. And be very, very careful, folks. There's a, a in Proverbs here, there's it's called the wisdom of Augur or Agur or whoever his name is. You want me to read it? I, I, it just, he just said this. I'll, I'll just quote it. He said, give me neither poverty or riches. Because he said, if you, give me po if you give me poverty, I'll be poor and I'll steal and I'll dishonor God. But if you give me riches, I'll forget about you. He understood culture. He understood what the culture was. Is, is prosperity wrong? Absolutely not. But he recognized his own self. He recognized the danger. Can, I put it, can we modernize it? He recognized the danger of American culture. He recognized the danger of American culture, the land of plenty. And I'll forget about my God. In other words, that culture will take me over because that's what she does is she tries to take you over with the culture, whether it's the evil side or the good side. And I've watched so many people start out. Ministers fall victim to this. Do you know that? Ministers fall victim to ministry becoming their idol idolatry. It becomes their purpose for living. Yeah. You wonder how all these leaders keep falling? We just read it. You're stuck in the culture. You've made God, you, this is what she does, is she makes God an avenue to get to the culture. Oh, if you, you, it's, it's, you listen to it, it's there. They preach all the time that this is what Christianity is, is you get the good part of the culture. So be careful. I'm warning everybody here. We kind of have a, a little protection dome right here, in, in a way, because for the most part, <laughs> We don't have a lot of the good part of the culture here. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. You go to the city, 
and get involved with that city spirit, we had a young girl that went from our store to the city. And when she came back to the store, she had a different countenance and a different spirit. I could detect it. It's a, it's a different spirit. And I could tell she'd been involved in some things that were probably not good, Christian-wise. Christian and she wasn't a Christian, but it just, it's just amazing how she, she went from looking like a farm girl or a small-town farm girl to this sophisticated, carrying certain spirits, other girl. So because we live in the area that we live in, there are some cultural things we can get hooked into. But being rich probably isn't one of them. What? That's probably not going to be one of them. People that win the Powerball. How, how, their lives are wrecked. Why? Because the spirit gets, I mean, they've already got the spirit and it just goes wild and they just go nuts. Always keep in mind, be aware, don't go. Watch out for the good culture that's out to get you. Some of you have got some real good talents in here. So be careful that you don't suck, get sucked into that spirit. Always give your first to God. Always. That's our call. That's our ministry. That's what we're to do. He gets the first. Don't eat food sacrificed to idols, or you'll pick up the nature and character of that thing. <clears throat> you know, I preached, I listened to a guy the other day, and he was ministering, and he said, if one thing... He says, one thing you need to get, understand is you need to say yes to God. That's true, isn't it? But I've preached in that church, and I preached on praise, and he didn't say yes to God there. Praise is not worship. Our definition. What is the American definition of worship? Hmm? What kind of songs? Slow songs. He talks about worship all the time. Because that's easy. Worship is easy. Did you know that? How much physical effort do you put into worship? Huh? When you're worshiping a slow song, how much effort does that take? Oh, man. I'm wore out. How much effort does that take? So people love, men love to talk about worship. But you notice, it's praise that breaks the enemy's back. It's praise that binds him with chains and fetters of iron. It's praise that beautifies us with salvation. Now, praise is a form of worship. Okay, so I'm not, don't, don't hear what I'm not saying. It is, a, but it, it's a form of worthship. You've heard that word before. You're giving worth to God. But we love to talk about worship. Men love to talk about worship because it doesn't require any effort. And you can just go like this. You know, you stand there. You're soaking. How wonderful. You can lay on the floor. How wonderful is that? See, praise isn't laying on the floor. Did you know that? It's being loud. It's being boisterous. It's being shooting out the hand. Praising him with the dance. Do you know why I hit Psalm 149 so much? Do you know why I preach that so much? It is our deliverance. But you know, our, this is what our church is known for. Out there. that don't, They don't know anything. That all we do is, that our big doctrine is tongues. That's our big doctrine. That's what they, th they think. They think that's all we do in here that I preach on tongues every week, I guess. That for 20 years I've been preaching on tongues. That's what they think. Because you see, not all churches speak in tongues. But I think all churches sing, don't they? 
Some don't have instruments, but they still sing. Almost every church I know of sings. So I can hit everybody with that. If I preach on tongues, they're going to get upset because they don't do it. But everybody sings. And so when we pray, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he says, okay, I'm going to send Mike to preach Psalm 149. I'm being merciful to you. I'm teaching you how to get, beautify yourself with salvation, bind the enemy, put vengeance on the enemy, and to give me pleasure. And they'll get angry at me. They'll grind their heels at. You know what this, you know, the, I've told you that people say, are you telling us we have to do it your way? That's the spirit. That's the Jezebel spirit. I had somebody say that about the Interchurch Council. They said, well, it, was, it disbanded because the leaders said it was our way or the highway. I didn't write this book. I keep telling everybody, I did not write this book. It's not my way. It's his way. There you go. Yeah. And all he's doing is answering some prayer that you made years ago where you said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And so God sent me or somebody like me to say what I had to say, and you rejected it. And that's why they kept being in bondage. To this day, that's why they stayed in bondage. They were praying the right things, and then as soon as God began to deliver them, like that guy in Proverbs said, they would forget about him. And they would not have this man to rule over us. So keep this in mind, folks. As you go about the coming years... Watch out for the culture, that we don't get stuck in the culture, the good part of the culture. When I vote, I vote the good part of the culture because I'd rather live under the good part than the evil. I mean, who wouldn't? Is there anybody here that wants to leave, live under the evil side? But I'm not to become a part of that culture. But if I have to live in it, I want to live on the good side, not the evil side. So I try to vote for what is the best part of the culture that we can live in while we gain this so that if it ever does come to the real evil side, we'll be able to handle it. God is giving us time. God is giving the church time to get, yeah, to get a foundation, to get a building started so that when evil times do come, we'll be able to handle it. But see, most of the church is asleep. Because they got this spirit in there. They don't know what's coming. They don't know. And to me, there's a tremendous victory. I think the victory is better to be able to serve God, go after Him, and give Him the first under the good side than under the evil side. I think that's what Scripture clearly shows, is whenever they got under the evil side, they would turn to God. But they never turned toward him, towards Him when they had the prosperity. They always forgot about Him and left Him. And I think there's a way to break that. I can't, I can't find it in Scripture yet, but I think there's a way to break that. I think the power of God is more powerful than the good side of the good culture. And that God can have a people. And I think that's how the bride's going to come. I think that's how the bride has to come. I think the bride has to come under the, the, under, the, um, under the covering of the good side of all the prosperity and all the richness that America has. I think that's where the bride's going to come from. I don't think she's going to come from the evil side. I think those are going to be the guests. I think the bride's going to come from the good side because they're going to give up all their prosperity. They're going to give up everything that America has to offer or whatever country it is. They're going to give it up and they're going to see more value in him than they do in this culture. And you have to recognize that spirit in order to, to, to become that. You got something? Because when, when you're desperate for God because of problems and everything, I mean, he... He says, come to me yeah. that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he can work on it. But it's still all about me. What can you do for me? How can you help me? I'm broken down. I'm hurting. You start there. 
But when you have everything, like you said, the prosperity, you, you have health, you have strength, you have your youth, you have your money, you have whatever, and you're still desperate for God because you want to know Him. Right. Then it's more all about Him instead yeah. of me and right. myself, my I and my problems. You Absolutely. Know? So that's why, like you said, the bride has made herself ready. Mm-hmm. In other words, she matured out of just being the needy kid, the needy child, the you know, the toddler. She became a bride who's looking at the husband, only having eyes for him, and I'm here to help him, and he helps me just yeah. because that's how it works. Yeah. See, you are now, this is what it means, is you are leaving your mother and your father. Right. The culture. To be joined to your husband. That's what it means. And you will find that, you know, that um, God always wants everybody to be the part of the bride. Just like you said, when we get when we get in trouble, we turn to him. All through read it from Genesis to Revelation. All through here. When they got in trouble, they would turn to him. But as soon as they got prosperous, they forgot about him. Every time. I still think that can be broken. I think that, I think, we're, like Steve, Pastor Steve said, let's be pattern breakers. Let's break this pattern. Yeah, it's one of the greater things. And to become loving God after God's heart in the midst of prosperity. We don't know. Because most of us here aren't what we would call real, prosper, real prosperous. You are compared to maybe some other countries. But in America, we're probably at the bottom. However, I do know this, that there are people in this body that could go other places and they could become prosperous. I know that. And they are choosing to stay here for this reason. And, and I'm not trying to make you stay here. Don't hear what I'm not saying. If you go someplace else. You said you chose. Huh? You said you chose. You choose. Yeah, you choose. But if you choose not to someday, don't choose because of American culture. All right? Choose because God is somewhere else and moving somewhere else and you're called to that other place. Please go because of that. Not because of the American culture. Or you will fall victim to this spirit. You'll go to sleep. You'll eat food sacrificed to idols, and you'll become dull just like everybody else. Watch how they act. I mean, when I see church people out at the ball game going, yeah, and then in church standing there like they're ready to keel over dead, I know what spirit's in that church. I know who's getting the first. Is it wrong to go, yeah, for the ball game? No, but you better be giving your first to God. Well, then I'm too tired. If, if I give it to God, I'm too tired. <laughs> then be tired for the ball game. Not to God. Any questions or anything? Well, I'm just... Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, I don't think anybody said anything. I, I just, you know, I'm constantly asking God, how do we do this? How do we get there? <laughs> you know, I keep saying, please make us do these things. Because I says, you know, it doesn't seem like, to me, we're moving fast enough. Maybe we are. Maybe it's just the hunger that's making me feel this way. But I just feel like I know what God wants, and I know he wants us to change in the midst of American culture and not let the culture be our driving factor. And so recognize when you listen to people out there, even here and here, that we're not preaching culture to you or using God to get to the, the good, the heavenly culture out there. Because there is no heavenly culture out there. The heavenly culture is in him. And that's where we have to go. I hope I got all this out of here. No.
Oh, I know. I do have another scripture. <laughs> Thank you, God. Maybe he was wanting me to save it for next, or two weeks. Is it two weeks? You got next week? Yeah. Um, this again back in 1 John. And I like this scripture here. I just wanted to read it because, <clears throat> you know, John, John's epistles are very black and white to me. And the more you understand the nature and character of God and what John is saying, you know why he was black and white. Because if, if you don't know the nature and character of God and you really don't know your Bible, you'll read this and, 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 and it will almost confuse you how John could be so bold to say the things that he said. This is in chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 1. And I've read this before, but I just want to share something a little bit different this time. It says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now he says many. Not just a few, he says many. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Now think about this. Wouldn't it be nice to be able to recognize the Spirit of God? I mean, he's talking about false prophets. He's talking about things that people are teaching, right? And he says, this is how you can recognize it. I mean, how many of us ever listen to people and we're wondering, is that really from God or not? Every spirit, now my, this is the NIV, it says, that acknowledges, the New King James says confesses, and I think the King James does too. And that means, listen to this, I've shared this before because i got it wrote here. It means to cons consent to the desire of another. So it doesn't mean lip service. It doesn't mean people are confessing Jesus with their mouth. It means they're consenting to the desire of another. You know that's how you were made? You were made that way. Did you know that? You're going to consent to the desire of somebody. Because you were made that way. It's just who, what desire are you going to consent to? That, con, that consents to the desire of Jesus, that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. So, if we consent to the will of another, what will are we supposed to consent to? The Father's will, right? So, if we're actually obeying this scripture, we are... Yielding to the will of another, right? We're, con we're consenting to the desire of another, right? And what does consenting mean? Huh? Give permission? In other words, if I consent to Kathy, she wants me to fix the ceiling, ceiling fan. <laughs> what? <laughs> and I consent to that, what does that mean? No, no, no. Does that just mean I say I'll fix it, but I don't do it? Is that consenting to her will? Think about how many, how, how many times have we consented to do somebody else's will and we don't do it. We tell somebody we're going to do something, we'll tell somebody we're going to be there, and we're not. We're going to fix something, we're going to clean something, we're going to paint something, we're going to... Anybody got testimony? That I, was, that I did this and people did this to me? So in other words, notice what it says too. It says every spirit. It doesn't say every mouth. It doesn't say every mouth that says Jesus has come in the flesh. It says every spirit that acknowledges it. Or in other words, every spirit that consents to the will of the Father. That's how you know if it's of God or not. So I go into a church, and it doesn't matter what church it is, everybody, we all think we're consenting to His will, right? Yeah. 
I mean, that's get, that gets preached in every charismatic church about doing His will, doing His will. Just like the guy said, yes, yes, you say yes to God, you're doing His will. And then I say, let's praise Him with the dance. Huh? No, they say no. That's the Antichrist. How many people would ever believe that in their heart they have the Antichrist? Yes, we're to do His will. Yes, yes, we're, we're consenting to His will. Are you coveting spiritual manifestations? No. Antichrist. I know, I've been there, and you probably have been too. I sat right there with leaders, and they, they are not going to do. that. They'll tell you they're consenting to His will. They'll preach it in their churches, but they're not doing it. Why? Because they got that spirit in their church. And their will is being directed by the culture. See, is your will being directed by the culture? What is the culture out there? What does the culture out there in America say about praising Him with the dance? Huh? What? Praise in your own way. Praise in your own way? What did you say? Foolish. Foolish. Crazy. Crazy. Now, who's really directing you? Effort. Too much effort. Who's really directing you? We're, now think about it. Think about the logic of this. We're in here praising God, singing at the top of our lungs, jumping, people praying and things like that for the king of the universe. They do it for 22 guys that run a dead pig up and down the field. Do you see anything wrong with that picture? <laughs> do you see anything wrong with that? Logically, think about that. And they're praising that that they have absolutely no part in. You're sitting in the stands. You're not take, participating in that game at all. You're paying people to, yeah, you're paying a fortune. You're giving your first of everything in that. And you're paying to see it. And then you stand like this in church. Yeah, don't dare, but yeah, don't even preach on money. I'll give hundreds of dollars to buy those tickets to watch 22 guys run a dead pig up and down the field, but don't you ask money for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <clears throat> they do the wave, they paint themselves, they go shirtless and they paint themselves in all kind of kooky colors. My, yeah, minus 10 degrees and they're out there with no shirt on. Oh, but if it snows a quarter inch, I can't make it to church. I think you can't make it. Yeah, they love overtime. But not at church. No, people love, yeah, because they like. See, some people, you have to understand something. Some people like just a good game. So if it goes into overtime, then it's good. If you have a team that you're rooting for, you don't like overtime because you want your team to win, and if it goes into overtime, they might lose. If you've got a team you're going for, you want them to be ahead 69-3 to at the end of the game. <laughs> to you, that was a good game. Three-hour game is usually about what they are. Nobody complains about it. Baseball can be longer. Think, just think of the logic. Think of, th you don't, Jezebel, she's in the church, and we, and we don't even know it. That tells you right there, she's in the church. When you got people that'll do that, spend that kind of money, and I'm just talking about an NFL, a, a professional game. I can go into all kind of different avenues here with this. And just go over one thing after another after another. Think logically of where we put our emotions, where we put our praise, where we put our uh, uh, exuberance, our money, and everything else. And you know exactly what spirit's in this church or in any church. Makes no sense to me. So any spirit that, that acknowledges Jesus has come in the flesh, in other words, 
I've always preached that Jesus is coming in your flesh because that's how it's worded in the King James is Jesus is come. Mine translated both of them has come, past tense. But it means is come in the flesh, present tense. He's coming in our flesh. And anyone who denies that is Antichrist. But I'm teaching a little bit differently. If you don't, if you don't yield to the will of another, the God, then you're Antichrist. So when somebody comes in and reads the scriptures about what we're supposed to do, I'll let you know where we're at. Well, those are just a couple of scriptures. There's a lot of stuff I can read in here. What else is in here? Losing your life for his sake. <clears throat> your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price and you're not your own. There's one in Galatians that says if you see anybody in a sin, you know, try to restore them, but consider yourself also. Lest you also be tempted. How many? Nobody in church ever did that to me. Because they knew what they'd get. <laughs> How many of you have ever tried to straighten somebody out? And they just loved you for it, right? They shook your hand, kissed you. Thank you. Huh? <laughs> to, to this day, they still love you. Huh? <laughs> now, see? You can't, it, that's what I mean. There's one thing after another, this is written in here. Um, talk about the Sabbath, giving, you know, the tithes and offerings, and people won't do it. Yet all the time saying, yeah, we confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. No, he hasn't. You're an antichrist. God, wouldn't it be te terrible to stand before Jesus on the day of judgment and find out that most of your life was Antichrist? And you spent your whole life in church? Huh? Yeah, that's what I say. And, and leading, that's what I mean. If, you, if your people are still in bondage and you, and you didn't teach anything to them to get them free from that, you've been, you were preaching Antichrist your whole ministry. Wouldn't that be awful? You were preaching something instead of Christ because why did he come here? To set us free. Open the, yeah, but that's what, opening the way to the Father is what sets us free. They're not preaching that. Most churches aren't preaching that. They're preaching what you should do here, but they're not preaching that the law of sin and death has been destroyed and that now we just have to work on our temptations and we can overcome them. They're not teaching that. Most of them. Hopefully the word's getting out. And it'll start spreading. Okay, I just wanted to read that scripture because I want, I want to gain a little bit of understanding on that. That if we're not acknowledging him, yielding our will to his, Jezebel's ruling that church. And got a hold of them. And if she's got a hold of that church or those people, they're living for the culture which is passing away. Because all, all, our culture, God's culture, is supposed to increase in everything. Yeah, go ahead. I also just wanted to point out, too, um, and you probably said this, but I just thought this was really good. You know, like most people probably read this and, you know, people acknowledging that Jesus came as a man mm -hmm. yeah. on the earth and walked on the earth. Yeah. All religions, about all religions right. do that. Right, yeah. But like what, what he's saying here is that every spirit that acknowledges Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, meaning we're to change. Yeah. Like that he is in our flesh, right. like we, he is being fleshed out. And so for, for anybody who also thinks, well, we can just, you know, accept Jesus into our heart and then we never have to change. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. That's, that's the, it's the gospel of death. It's Jezebel. It's all of that. You know, um, <clears throat> I've said this before, Romans in Romans chapters, chapter 10, I think it's 10, 9, and 10, isn't it? Or, yeah. In the Roman road. They always pulled that out and made that about going to heaven. If you, if you read what we just read about John, if you read the preceding scriptures, it's all talking about loving and not loving and hating and gives you all of these things to tell 
you know, all these commands that we're to be doing and to let you know if you're doing these other things, you're not in the kingdom of God. And then he puts that right there in there. And we do the same thing. We lift that out and we make an entire doctrine about, um, you know, just confessing with your mouth. We make a whole doctrine out of that, just like we did Romans 10, 9, and 10. Not realizing that Romans 10, 9, and 10 is the first 10 and a half chapters of Romans, which is what? What is, what is the first ten and a half chapters of Romans? <laughs> Getting set free of sin. It's where we read about the law of sin and death. It's where he said, if I'm in Christ Jesus, I've been free from the law of sin and death. And I'm, if my mind is set on heavenly things, it's life. It's set on carnal things, it's death. John is saying exactly the same thing, only with different words. There's nothing in Romans, there, look, the word heaven is only mentioned twice in Romans, and it has nothing to do with going to heaven, the two times it's mentioned. Yet we pulled that out and made a scripture about going to heaven, when it doesn't even talk about that. It's not even talked about in the book of Romans at all, going to heaven. It's talked about getting free from sin, and that's what John is saying also. Because if you read just the preceding scriptures, he's talking that the scriptures that I, this is where I discovered it, where John says that uh, Jesus was manifested to take away our sin. You know, and he goes on down, he says, for the devil has sinned from the beginning, and you know he was manifested to destroy the works of the devil. How many people take that scripture and use it for healing? I'm not saying you can't do that, but what is the context? The context is destruction of sin. And then right after that, he, we, wrote, we just read that scripture where it says, He who acknowledges Jesus has come in the flesh. So John is saying exactly the same thing that uh, Paul wrote, only John's words are a whole lot different, but it's the same concept. Getting free from sin. Because that was always God's heart, because sin destroys us. It's God's heart to set us free. Not to condemn us, not to point us out that we're bad, bad people. You don't have to worry about that. There are no good people. I read that in a church and I thought I was going to get stoned. <laughs> or I said that in church. I said, you know, the book, why do good things happen to bad people? Because there are no good people, that's why. It says it right in there. It says there's no one good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. Yeah, Jesus said it too. There is no one good but God. Thank you. <laughs> but boy, did I hit a cultural wall that night. Are you telling me we're not good? That's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> there are no good people. We're all bad. I think the scripture says something like, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I think the scripture says something like, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. I think it says something like that, doesn't it? Yeah. Are you telling us we have to do it your way? <laughs> That's not my way. That's what God said. And he's not saying that to put us down. He's saying that so that we recognize where we're at. We fall down, cry out for mercy, and then God will send his mercy, and then you better yield to it. Otherwise, you're double-minded, and you get nothing. Okay? All right. Anybody else? Father, we thank you once again for your word this morning. And again, God, just keep us on the wear. Keep us on the wear of this culture that is always trying to gain entrance it, it, it can be in the political realm, it can be in the wealth realm, it can be in the health realm, it can be in any realm that we start to yield to culture rather than you. And Father, keep us in line, keep us in the culture of the kingdom of God, for that's where we want to be. Not the kingdom of ministry, not the kingdom of charity towards people. God, those are fine things, those are part of you, but we want to keep in the culture of the kingdom of God, which is knowing you. Jesus said knowing you was salvation wasn't going to heaven. It wasn't getting born again to go to heaven. It was getting born again so that we could know you, so that it could take the law of sin and death out of the way so that we could then start to yield to your ways that bring us life because that was always your goal. It's been your goal from the beginning was to get us back to the garden or get us back to where we, what we lost. 
And Father, I just thank you that we'll always keep that before us, that that is always your heart, no matter what happens to us, no matter what, it doesn't make any difference whether we fail. I mean, it does as far as we're concerned, but you will have your bride perfect without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. The devil can sit there and say, yeah, you're this way, yeah, you're that way, and I agree. You're right, devil. I agree with you. But Jesus was perfect, and Jesus will have his bride perfect without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. If I'm a part of it, that's going to be wonderful, but he's going to have it one way or the other. And I'm going to try to push it, and I'm going to push it, and push it, and push it in this, in this spirit realm, in this culture, and I'm going to continue to preach it. And Father, make us to be the ones to yield. God, at least if, if we don't, God, let us be ones that push your kingdom forward and not hold it back or keep people in captivity. Let us not teach things that cause the culture to come in and start to take over our emotions, our reactions, our actions, our decision-making, our loves and our dislikes. Father, we want our culture to be in you. And we just thank you, Lord, that you'll continue us, continue to keep us on that straight path. Let us not veer to the left or to the right. You said we would hear a voice behind us. God, we need that voice desperately. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.